Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Hitek. Did you know that about 90% of the book of Revelation either quotes or references the Old Testament? From the beginning, the Lord communicated a great deal about the future to His people. In this teaching series, Pastor Skip explains the theology of the end times and the differing conclusions biblical scholars have reached. The end may be nearer than you think. Finding that God is doing exactly what He said. tornado outbreak continuing in the shelter in We know the World Health Organization just to, to declare this a global health the city emergency. city of over in Iraq. I think it's going to be rebuilt. There's already things happening there today. And I'm try them. Now for the last look. Well, good morning. Officially, good morning to you all. This weather is awesome. Outside, I know there's a good crowd out there in the amphitheater. Welcome all those of you who are enjoying the day. It's good weather inside as well, and uh, we're glad you joined us for church. Um, turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We are doing a study on the end times. We've been going into depth on some of these topics. I stated that my aim is to make you an expert in eschatology. It still is my aim to do so. So uh, we are looking this week at the glorious blessed hope of the church, the rapture of the church. And I'm going to have you turn to John 14, a passage that um, some people might think has nothing to do with the rapture, but uh, the more I've studied it, the more I have to say it definitely has everything to do with the rapture. In fact, it can really mean nothing else than being one of the first mentions or intimations of that in the New Testament, John chapter 14. So there was a man who was taking a walk. He walked over to a bridge over a river in his town, and he noticed that there was a man, another man standing on that bridge. Apparently, it looked like he was about to jump. So the first man who saw that walked over to him to save him, and he said, why would you want to kill yourself? The man replied, I have nothing to live for. The visitor said, do you believe in God? The man said, yes, I do. The first guy said, what a coincidence, so do I. Are you a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian? He said, I'm a Christian. What a coincidence, so am I. Are you a Protestant or a Catholic? The man said, I'm a Protestant. The helper said, what a coincidence, so am I. Are you Anglican, Lutheran, Baptist? The man said, I'm a Baptist. The guy said, what a coincidence. So am I. Are you a Southern Baptist or an Independent Baptist? He said, I'm a Southern Baptist. The man said, what a coincidence, so am I. Then he said, are you premillennial or amillennial? He said, I'm premillennial. The man said, what a coincidence, so am I. And finally he said, are you pre-tribulation rapture or mid-tribulation rapture or post-tribulation rapture? The man said, I'm mid-tribulation rapture. At that point, the would-be helper pushed the man off the bridge and said, Die, heretic! Die! Now, there has been, over time, disagreement as to is there a rapture, is there not a rapture, when will the rapture happen, when will it not happen? There has been disagreement, and sometimes very heated disagreements, over the idea of the rapture. But we don't want to seek anyone harm in trying to understand it. When I first heard of the rapture, I was a new believer. This is way back. And uh, I had been saved a few weeks. And somebody introduced the topic of the rapture of the church. I said, the what? And he said, the rapture. You know, we're all going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And I said, you can't believe that. He said, absolutely, I believe. I said, that's nonsense. 
I mean, it just, it did not compute. I had never heard of it before uh, growing up in the church in which I was raised. And uh, I, I just was suspect of even believing that that could ever happen. Well, then I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 and John 14, among other texts. And uh, I discovered not only will there be a rapture, I got pretty excited about the prospect that Jesus could come at any moment to take his church with him. But I also saw a misunderstanding develop among many of my friends. Um, Some viewed the rapture as a way to escape responsibility. I mean, you know, if if Jesus can come back at any moment, man, I can overdraw on my credit accounts and overcharge on my credit cards and do all sorts of irresponsible stuff because, hey, the Lord will come back and whisk me away. And so I even found myself praying for the Lord to return, like right before a final exam, Uh, or, or... when I saw those lights in my rearview mirror pulling me over for speeding. Lord, this would be a great time for you to come back right now. I even remember being terrified that I had missed the rapture. I went to a Bible study. It was in the evening. It was in the summer. I walked into a living room. I walked in. Nobody was there, but Bibles were on the floor in a circle. Notebooks, pens, jackets, not a single person. I thought... I just missed the rapture of the church. And I panicked. They were just outside looking at something, and then they came in. It was a matter of timing, but I panicked. I found this week an article that says, Herbert Washington, whom co-workers at Significant Plastics Incorporated say was unduly concerned with the rapture and the second coming of Christ, suffered a serious heart attack when co-workers pretended that they had been caught away without him. Now, this is a cruel thing, and I know they didn't intend for that to happen, but the article said, um, somebody, part of the co-worker said, we didn't mean to scare him to death, said one woman. He's just always talking about it, so today we decided to turn the tables on him. Well, Washington underwent bypass surgery, and is recovering well, and he is digging into the Bible like never before, says his wife. What is the rapture? What is the rapture of the church? Where did that idea come from? Is it a new idea, as some purport? Is it something we should seriously consider, and if so, why should we? And then when will it happen exactly? Well, those are questions we want to answer uh, today and in the next couple of weeks. I'm taking you to John 14 because it's a very seminal passage in my view. It's a very uh, important passage uh, regarding this. It's a promise Jesus gives. John 14 is called the Upper Room Discourse. It is the second longest sermon Jesus ever preached recorded in the Bible. First is the Sermon on the Mount. The second one is the Upper Room Discourse. It's called that because he gave the discourse in the upper room. Very good. So uh, this is the Last Supper. Uh, He is with his disciples. It is a private session. His public ministry has ended. He has been rejected by the nation of Israel. He soon will be crucified. And his disciples are filled with anxiety. And for a very good reason that I want to show you. And he turns to his troubled disciples and says, Look, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back to get you and take you where I am. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the first six verses of John chapter 14. And I'd like to show you four features about this rapture, this coming that he refers to. In verse 1, Jesus says to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The first feature of this coming I want to draw your attention to is the comfort of it. The comfort of it. Let not your heart be troubled. Why on earth would Jesus say that to his disciples? Because they were troubled. They were troubled. In fact, the anxiety among that group is rising minute by minute. Why? Because in this setting, in this supper, this last supper, the upper room discourse, he has already announced that he is leaving. I want you to just look at that. Go back to chapter 13, just a few verses before this. In verse 33, John 13, 33, our Lord speaking, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come, so I now say to you. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And then look over at chapter 16, same setting, same sermon, chapter 16, verse 6, Jesus notes, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They are confused when Jesus gives this promise in John 14. Why? Because they've left everything. They've been following him for three years, nonstop, 24-7. They've given up everything, they're with him, they're anticipating something to happen, and now he says to them, bye, I'm going now, I'm leaving now. This is not what they wanted to hear, it's not what they expected to hear. They are bewildered, they are confused, they are troubled, filled with anxiety. And so he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Now that's a commandment. It is, in the original language in which the New Testament was written, it's a present, passive imperative. It means it's a command, an imperative, so he's giving them a command. But it's a present, passive imperative, meaning stop an action already going on. He's not saying, don't start worrying. He's saying, you're already worried. You're already freaking out. Stop it. Stop an action that is ongoing. So it would be better translated, do not let your heart continue to be agitated. Now, because it's a commandment, it shows me that our emotions can be controlled. How you feel can't necessarily be controlled, but what you do and how you react to how you feel can be controlled. Every command in the Bible comes with a capacity. God would never give you a command unless he gave you the power to follow that command. So, the pathway to comfort is to take control of your thoughts and remind yourself of God's promise. If you want to be comforted, just practice that. Take control of your thoughts and focus on God's promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, bringing Every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he tells them, stop freaking out. Stop worrying. He wants to comfort them. Let not your heart be Troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He continues to reinforce this comforting promise. There is 
Nothing more comforting to those of us alive right now than the assurance that Jesus could come back at any moment for us. That's a word of comfort. When Paul speaks about the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he tells his audience, use what I just told you to comfort one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Listen, every tomorrow has two handles, the handle of anxiety and the handle of faith. You, you'll grab one or the other, the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. If you always are grabbing the handle of anxiety, you will freak out. If you're always grabbing the handle of faith, you will chill out. And because the Bible has one-fourth prophecy in it, 25, 26% of the Bible is prophetic, that's a lot of handles to have faith for the future. So he says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, in comforting them, he describes heaven to them. And I want you just to notice this very quickly, that he describes heaven in four ways. First, heaven is a real place. I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven isn't a figment of your imagination. Heaven is not wishful thinking. It's not a thought that you use to psych yourself out to get through this present life. It's an actual, real place. Second, it's a relational place. Notice that Jesus calls heaven my Father's house. He doesn't use the generic term heaven. He calls it my Father's house. Why? Because when you're there, you'll be with your heavenly Father, your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a relational place. You'll also be reunited with those believers who have died before you, Paul will tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So it's a real place. It's a relational place. Third thing to note about heaven, it's a diverse place. In my Father's house, there are many, what's the next word? Mansions. That's an unfortunate translation, in my opinion. Because when you hear the word mansions, I know you're thinking like Beverly Hills, Bel Air, um, some spread in Texas where you've got like 150 acres on either side and a mansion right in the middle. The actual word that he uses is the word monet, and it simply means a staying or an abiding place, a dwelling place. It is sometimes translated room or apartment. In my father's house are many rooms. In my father's house are many apartments. So it sounds, instead of like Beverly Hills and Bel Air or Texas, it sounds more like it's one big house with a bunch of rooms added on. And uh, let me just throw this thought at you. I think it will help you to understand this passage better if you understood the background of an ancient Jewish wedding. So here's how it went. When a young man gets to be of age where he can get married, uh, and it's time for him to get engaged, he enters into a formal contract of espousal or engagement. It lasts one year. Once he gets formally engaged, he goes back to his father's house and begins building a room onto that house that he and his bride will eventually live in. By the way, that is still in practice today in Israel. You'll find a house and then rooms get added on and floors get added on because family members get married and move to their father's house. When it's time for the wedding to take place, the young man goes to his own father, gets permission to get his bride, then goes to the bride's house unannounced. There's a time frame, a time parameter, so they have to get ready, but they have to get ready in advance and be ready at any time. When that young man gets to the town, a trumpet is blown. He shouts with his voice and calls her name, comes to the house, 
gets his bride to be and the wedding party, and they go back to his father's house where there is a wedding, there is a wedding supper, and there's a feast that lasts typically for seven days. So in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Now, just for fun, because I, I, I see a corollary, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 21. And let me uh, show you, turn to Revelation 21. Let me show you what I think, at least in part, is meant by my father's house. Because we are given a description of your future home. Revelation 21, we won't read it all, though it's a fascinating chapter. But let me take you to verse 2, where we are told this. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Go down to verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, Descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the 12 gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length, get this, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Let me tell you where we're at in Revelation 21. The rapture is over. The tribulation is over. The second coming has happened. The thousand-year millennial kingdom has happened. It's now over. God has destroyed the earth and the heavens and built a new heaven, a new earth. And with this new heaven and new earth, John looks and sees the capital city of new heaven and new earth called New Jerusalem. And it says, it descends from heaven downward toward the earth. So it comes sort of like as a satellite from heaven down to the earth. And its measurement is given in furlongs. But that would equate to 2,250,000 square miles. So picture a cube, because the measurements are the same in all directions, a cube That's 2,250,000 square miles, or roughly the same size as our moon. Same size as our moon, only not round, but cubed. And one scientist estimated 20 billion people could inhabit the New Jerusalem. And assuming that 25% of the city was used for dwelling places for the residents, and the rest for whatever else, streets, parks, public buildings, etc. That if that were the case, that many people, 20 billion people, could each have one cubicle block with 75 acres on each face to call their own. Crazy, but cool. And I, I like looking at this. My father's house are many rooms. This seems to fit the description better than Well, it's a whole lot better than, when I die, I'm going to sit on a cloud and and wear a white robe and play a harp. I'll be the first to say, no, thank you. I'm going to be snooping around all the rooms, (laughs) yours included. Check it out. I'm not going to get bored. 
So it's a real place. It's a relational place. It's a diverse place. And finally, it's a personalized place. I go to prepare a place for you, for you. Think of it this way. There's a place in heaven, a space devoted with you in mind. I like to think of it this way. When Jesus was on earth, he was a carpenter. Now he's a custom builder. Something just with you in mind. So that's the comfort of it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, let, let me take you to a second feature, and that is the chronology of it. In verse 3, he said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, here it is, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus promises to receive believers to himself and take them to be in the Father's house. Now, um, some people look at this and they try to soften the meaning of it by saying, well, he's just talking about when you die. When you die, he's going to receive you to where he is. But Jesus has been speaking literally so far. He's been speaking of departing, literally. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he did leave. And so I would infer then that when he speaks of returning, he's not speaking of you dying necessarily, but him literally returning some sort of coming in which he is going to receive believers to himself and take them to heaven, to his father's house. And just notice the wording. I'm going to receive you to myself. I'm coming back to get you and take you to where I am. So that can't refer to death because of the literalness of the passage. Number two, it can't refer to the second coming of Christ in Revelation 19 because at that event, he comes to the earth with his saints to set up the kingdom. It must, therefore, refer to something else. I will receive you to myself that where I am you may be also. And I believe it refers to the rapture. It's at least one of the first uh, intimations of the rapture. Jesus coming for his church to take the saints on the earth from earth to heaven. Now when he said this, the disciples did not understand that. I can safely say that. They weren't like going, oh yeah, awesome, I get it. They were just deer in the headlights. They didn't get it, they didn't understand it. And what's interesting is Jesus didn't stop to explain it to them. And here's why. They're in no condition for an eschatology lesson. It's like, okay, let me tell you about eschatology in the end times. They're freaking out. Jesus just said, I'm leaving. This is not what they wanted to hear nor expected to hear. So he's saying this to them. They're not getting the full implications of that. Jesus doesn't explain it to them. But later on, they will get it. And Paul the Apostle will explain it quite nicely. Once again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Sometimes people will say to me, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Actually, it is in the Bible. You just have to have the right Bible. If you had a Latin Bible, the word rapturas is there, raptured. The word Paul used, and we'll get to this next week, is harpazo, caught away, catch up. It means to pluck or to snatch away violently or to take by force, just to swoop up. So Jesus likewise promises, I will receive you to myself. In fact, I want to show you a little chart that I put together um, to show you that John 14 is a linguistic parallel to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at the similarities. In John 14, Jesus said, If I go, I will come again. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul wrote, The Lord himself will descend from heaven. In John 14, I will receive you to myself. 
Paul wrote for Thessalonians 4, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. John 14, Jesus said that where I am, there you may be also. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul wrote, thus we will always be with the Lord. John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, therefore comfort one another with these words. It's a a similarity in the highlights of both of those passages that blend beautifully. Now, when we talk about this rapture, um, um, it's very different than another event called the second coming. The rapture is not the second coming. The second coming is not the rapture. It is two events. Uh, Some see them as uh, slightly apart. Some see them as three and a half years apart. Some see them as seven years apart. That's where I land, and I'll show you next week why that is, why I believe that. But the the rapture, Jesus coming here uh, for the saints, for the church, is different than the second coming. Let me give you those differences. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. At the second coming, Jesus comes with his church. At the rapture, Jesus comes from heaven into the air, somewhere in the atmosphere, and we meet him there. At the second coming, Jesus comes from heaven through the air all the way to the earth. At the rapture, he claims his bride. At the second coming, he comes with his bride. At the rapture, the focus is Jesus and the church. At the second coming, the focus is Israel and the kingdom. The rapture will be sudden, Unpredictable, signless. Sudden, unpredictable, and signless. As Paul said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The second coming is just the opposite. It is predictable. It's after seven years. In fact, if we took the tribulation period and we were in the tribulation right now, and let's say it's like we're three and a half years in because we just saw on the news that some guy went into the Holy of Holies and said he was God and stopped the sacrifices. We could count 42 months from that moment, 1,260 days to be precise, and know exactly when Jesus is coming back. So it is a predictable event and There are signs that accompany that. Jesus gave many of them in Matthew 24. There will be a darkened sun. The moon and the stars will fall from the sky. Smoke will fill the earth. So on and so on. At the rapture, only believers will see him. As Jesus said here, or or as Paul said, "We, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord. At the second coming, every eye shall see him. In fact, you know how Jesus described the second coming? He said, for as lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Everyone will see that event. Worldwide coverage. Rapture is very different than the second coming. So we've noticed the comfort and the chronology of it. Let me take you to the controversy of it. Look at verse 4. He says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, a Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Why did he say this? Because he's honest. What Jesus has just told them, they were not expecting to hear. The last thing they were expecting Jesus to say is, I'm leaving now. Oh, I'll be back, but I'm leaving. Leaving? And here's why there was that controversy. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish mindset, disciples included, there was a fixed eschatology in their thinking. That is, there was a scenario they believed in that would happen in the end of days when the Messiah comes. And here it is in a nutshell. Number one, just before the Messiah comes, there will be a time of terrible turmoil. They saw the Roman invasion and occupation of their land as a fulfillment of that. Things are pretty bad. Romans are in control. We get beaten up all the time by these guys. 
That's number one. Number two, in the midst of that turmoil, a forerunner will come, an Elijah-like forerunner as predicted in the Old Testament. He's going to show up and point the way to the Messiah. That's why people were so interested in John the Baptist. They even ask him, are you Elijah? Are you that prophet? Number three, after the forerunner comes, the Messiah will appear. He will establish his kingdom. He will defeat his enemies. And number four, all the scattered Jews around the world will return to Israel and Jerusalem will be physically restored and spiritually restored under Messiah. It's safe to say that all of the disciples in that room believed that they were at phase three. Phase three. Turmoil has happened. Forerunner has come. He's the Messiah. Moreover, a couple days ago, he just came into Jerusalem on a donkey and everybody hailed him, Messiah, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so they're going, hot diggity dog. He's now going to establish his kingdom. That's what they expected. So he comes and has dinner with them and says, oh, by the way, bye, I'm leaving. Sorrow has filled their heart. They're filled with confusion, filled with anxiety. It's not what they expected to hear. In fact, they are so fixated on this, they still don't let it go after the resurrection. Acts chapter 1, Jesus raised from the dead. They come to him and the disciples say, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking that way. So I'm just touching on this because I'm going to move on, but whatever their eschatology was, whatever their belief about the end times was, number one, they were wrong. And number two, it would change. In the days ahead, they'll learn to think differently. So they were wrong at the moment, and it would change in the future. Now, Jesus' coming is still controversial. Never mind pre, mid, post, tribulation stuff. There are some people who don't even believe in a rapture at all. There is so much confusion and disagreement even among believers. So, whatever eschatology you happen to believe in, number one, you could be wrong. And number two, it could change. And you always want to be open to change when it comes to truth. You, you want to not approach the scripture with, this is what it must say, but what does the Bible say? Letting it speak to you and forming your belief system around what you discover. I didn't believe in a rapture at first. I changed. That changed. Well, let's move on and let me give you the, the final one, and that is the consequences of it. So back to verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, look, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, we pick on Thomas. I think we pick on him way too much. I actually like him. I know, well, he's doubting Thomas. He's the disciple with a question mark for a brain. Uh, he's the apostle from Missouri, the show me state. Show me, show me. But I, I like him because he's honest. I, I can sort of picture the scene where Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my father has from many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you so. I'm going to prepare. I'll come back. And they're all going, yeah. They're, you're stroking their beards. Awesome. That's so heavy. That's so deep. Yeah, man. And, and not even knowing what he's saying. Except for one guy. And Thomas goes, excuse me, time out. I don't get it. All the heads turn to him. Don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how can we know how to get there? And so I actually love Thomas for saying this because if he wouldn't have asked this question, we wouldn't have had this answer. And the answer is precious. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now in that answer, Jesus speaks of a tragedy. And here's the tragedy. Not everyone gets to go to the Father's house. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So what that tells me is that the rapture is a selective event. A selective event. Not everybody goes. Not everybody gets taken. Uh, it is reserved for family members only. 
because it is the Father's house. I know the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, and that is true. He doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. He is not willing that any should perish. The tragedy is many people are themselves willing to perish. Many people say, I don't, stop, tell me no more. I don't care, I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to accept Christ. Well, I just want you to know God will honor your choice. He doesn't force people to come, but he invites them to come. But he will honor whatever choice you make. I just want you to notice how dogmatic, dare I say even narrow-minded, Jesus is in this statement. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's pretty dogmatic. He did not say, I am a way. I'm one of many ways. I'm one of many spiritual paths. Choose your own journey. He didn't say, I'll show you the way. He said, I am the way, the truth. The life. Now, that's not what most people think. Am I right? Most people do not believe what Jesus just said. They don't think that way. What most people think is most everybody dies and goes to heaven. Everybody will go to heaven. Well, maybe a few people don't go to heaven. Well, well, who? Well, Adolf Hitler. Okay, you got anybody else besides him? Because everybody says that. Okay, uh, Mussolini maybe, uh, Paul Pot. I can think of a few people. Okay, so you got like five people that are going to go to hell. Everybody else goes to heaven. Listen, that's fake news. That's fake news. The truth is Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Very, very narrow. In fact, he gets as narrow in Matthew 7 when he said, Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, i.e. hell. And many go in by it, but narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few, few who find it. Peter will declare in Acts chapter 4, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Very narrow, very dogmatic, very true. So, to close this up, the good news is Jesus Christ is coming back. The bad news is Jesus Christ is coming back. The good news is some will be ready. The bad news is many will not be ready. The good news is Jesus will take believers to heaven. The bad news is there will be many unbelievers that will not be taken. The good news is anyone can go to heaven. The bad news is many people will go to hell. Because God will honor people's choice. And isn't it interesting that it comes down to that choice of faith that God places in our power. Yes, God is sovereign and predestines, and that's a whole other subject. But when it comes to us, he gives us the power to say yes to him or to say no to him. And he places that in your grip, and he says, well, what will it be? You're for me or against me? You'll come to me and and accept me, or you can reject me. It's your choice, and I'll honor your choice. I always say God is pro-choice when it comes to heaven. What will it be? Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.